This program was made possible in part by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. June 4, 1944. As the Allies prepare for the largest amphibious invasion in history, they have a secret victory off the coast of West Africa. U.S. Navy ships forced German U-boat 505 to the surface. Captain Daniel Gallery orders his pilots not to blow the U-boat out of the water. Blue Jay to Blondie, I want to capture this bastard if possible. For the first time in 130 years, American sailors capture an enemy vessel at sea, and with it, Enigma code machines. from Captain Gallery's top secret report. Without hesitation, the boarding party took their lives in their hands and plunged down the conning tower hatch. Not knowing at what moment the boat might either blow up or sink, they seized all the important looking papers. U-505's crew is transferred to the USS Guadalcanal. Astonished sailors on both sides look the enemy in the eye for the first time. The German sailors will spend the rest of the war in a Louisiana POW camp. The enigmas and code books go to Allied intelligence. Captain Gallery. When remarkable luck was required, we had it. When perfect cooperation between aircraft and surface vessels was required, it was there. When outstanding heroism was required, it was commonplace. No one will know about it for years. If the Germans discover what happened to the Enigma machines, they would change their codes, a potential disaster for what is about to happen in France. Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade toward which we have striven these many months. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Good luck. June the 6th, D-Day. The Allies are finally ready to take Western Europe back from those who conquered it. 175,000 Americans, British, Canadians, and Free French begin the assault on the German-held beaches at Normandy. Private Dom Bart to his wife in Brooklyn. I could hear the artillery and the brr, 
burp of machine gun fire. A landing craft was half filled with water. I never thought we would make it. Finally, the word came. Let's go. And there we were in combat. Something new in my life. Sergeant Eugene Lawton. We hit the water and waded ashore. Under cover of this high ground, we were safe. But somewhere in front of us was an enemy who knew how to soldier. I lost all hopes and said my last prayer to the good Lord. Got to the beach half frozen and almost unable to move, and then I passed out. When I came to, the fighting was at a climax. With sheer will, fear, and luck, we overcame. The price was high, but we covered ourselves with glory. Love and kisses, Dom. By D-Day's end, a narrow strip of France is free again. President Roosevelt leads his nation in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic and to set free a suffering humanity. And let our hearts be stout to bear sorrows that may come to impart our courage unto our sons, wheresoever they may be. Eugene Lawton. Mom and Dad, I'm afraid I can't go beyond what I've already told you. Can say I was hit, but as to date, time, and place, as censorship doesn't permit it, why try to write about it? I'm doing fine. Love always, Sonny. Martha Gellhorn stows away on a hospital ship to be one of the first reporters in Normandy. It will be hard to tell you of the wounded. There were so many of them. They had to be fed, as most of them had not eaten for two days. Their shoes had to be cut off. They wanted water. They were a magnificent, enduring bunch of men. Men smiled who were in such pain that all they really can have wanted to do was to turn their heads away and cry. And men made jokes when they needed their strength just to survive. Ten thousand Allied soldiers, six thousand of them American, are killed or wounded on D-Day, far fewer than command predicted. The rest move out. The British and Canadians head east and north. The Americans go west. Jackie Greer writes to her fiance, Quentin Annanson, about D-Day in Baton Rouge. All America had been asked to pray, so I slipped out of bed and knelt in prayer for a few minutes. I prayed for all the boys over there, but mostly I prayed for you. Protected by barrage balloons and air cover, men and material come ashore in a seemingly endless chain of supply. Ollie Stewart reporting in the Afro-American. Everything for the fighting man is unloaded on the beaches to be hauled to the front. If one single day our soldiers had to lean on their rifles because they had no bullets, we would have been thrown back into the sea. But we haven't been thrown back into the sea because the boys keep them rolling. Pulitzer Prize winner Ernie Pyle for the Scripps Howard News Service. On the beach itself were all kinds of wrecked vehicles. There were half tracks carrying office equipment that had been made into a shambles by a single shell hit. There are interiors still holding smashed typewriters, telephones, office files. And standing out there on the water beyond, was the greatest armada man has ever seen. You simply could not believe the collection of ships that lay out there waiting to unload. Its utter enormity would move the hardest man. Army nurses arrive on D-Day plus four. Field hospitals deploy, including the 50th General Hospital. They raise their tents in a Normandy cow pasture, the theory being where cows are, landmines aren't. Clearing and construction are done by African-American GIs. Segregated from white troops, 
most African Americans in uniform are given only basic support services to perform. Reporter Ollie Stewart. Keeping supplies moving is now in the hands of colored motor transport companies. The Army functions on racial lines. Officers talk race, not ability. Everywhere, poorly trained people of color are among those who handle munitions, often sacrificing safety for speed. On July 17th, four days before these bombs arrive in Europe, a massive explosion at the Port Chicago Naval Station in California kills 320 people, including 202 African-American sailors, the largest home front disaster of the war. Ordered to continue handling munitions as before, 258 African-American sailors refuse. All are court-martialed, 50 for mutiny. Some men initially get sentences of 15 years, but the disaster does help encourage desegregation of the Navy. Even before its tents are up, the 50th hospital starts filling with casualties from fighting in the Normandy hedgerows. Jay Sullivan. Dear Mom, how I got here in the middle of hell's a poppin' I don't know, but here I am, Rommel on one side, the sea on the other. The Western Front isn't much bigger than a baseball diamond, but what a diamond. The best army in the world is here, and they're going to do to the dastard Germans what Uncle Al's boys didn't do in the last war. Al Schock writes home to Phyllis in South Dakota. This past week has seemed like a year. The Germans are only about 150 yards to our front on the next hedgerow. Every hedgerow becomes a potential battlefield. Going is difficult. However, we manage to drive the Krauts back some every day. By June 30th, 27,000 American casualties have been evacuated, 11,000 killed in action. The Germans have a natural ally in France, an extremely wet summer that favors the entrenched defender over the mobile attacker. Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower writes, when I die, they ought to hold my body for a rainy day and then bury me out in the middle of a storm. This damned weather is going to be the death of me yet. The Allies finally break out on July 27th. The Germans are forced back towards the Fatherland, chased by one of the most mobile armies in history. And a new leader arrives the American general the German command fears most, George Patton. I'm proud to be here to fight beside you. Now let's cut the guts out of those krauts and get the hell on to Berlin. And when we get to Berlin, I'm going to personally shoot that paper-hanging son of a bitch just like I would a snake. This is Douglas Edwards reporting that American armored columns in France in advances of more than 30 miles have pushed the Germans to the approaches of Saint-Nazaire and Nantes. The Russians are slicing forward over the Polish plains tonight within 40 miles of Krakow and 72 miles of German Silesia. 1944 is a time of promises. Roosevelt promises Churchill to be tough with Germany at war's end. And I mean the German people, he says, not just the Nazis. We either have to castrate them or treat them so they can't just go on reproducing people who want to continue the way they have in the past. 1944 is also an election year. In speeches and even cartoons, the president's supporters promise that life will be better, especially for veterans who would get easy loans and a free education through the new GI Bill of Rights. August 1944, another Allied armada steams towards southern France to open the Second Front. Landing on the Riviera, American and French forces meet fierce opposition in some areas, but advance easily elsewhere. Larry Kane writes to his wife. On we sweep. The tanks, the half-tracks, the trucks, the jeeps careening wildly in clouds of choking, blinding dust. To hell with the enemy. 
keep pushing. Do it the Russian way. Fighting beside the French and Yanks are men and women of the resistance, described by Eisenhower as worth six divisions. Fifty-seven thousand Germans are taken prisoner. Within a month, the Allies control most of France. CBS News, August 25th. American and French troops have made their way to the heart of Paris. General Electric takes you to London. Richard C. Hotelet reporting. Radio Paris has been broadcasting all afternoon descriptions of the city going wild with joy of enthusiastic welcome to the French and American troops. Colonel Alexander Standish writes home from Paris on Liberation Day. As we passed the Palais Royal, shooting broke out all around. Snipers were firing into the crowds. The parade broke up quickly as resistance men took positions to return the fire. Finally, two snipers were driven from the building, beaten savagely, and shot. Ali Stewart reports for his newspaper, The Afro-American. Beautiful women dashed into the streets to kiss dusty GI lads, to throw flowers and offer wine. I've never been kissed so much in all my life. It is a beautiful custom. A GI explains to his chaplain, Rabbi David Max Eichhorn. French girls haven't got anything that American girls haven't got. The important thing at the moment is that the French girls have it here. Ernie Pyle remarks to a friend. Any GI who doesn't get laid tonight is a sissy. The Army distributes 50,000 condoms monthly at three for a dime. But abstinence is encouraged. From a 1943 manual, Psychology for the Fighting Man. The soldier whose standards are such that he can indulge in promiscuous sexual activity without disgust may be an efficient soldier. Such a man may, however, seriously disturb the morale of other men. His loose talk may rouse the sexual needs of men of more complicated character. Men should keep their minds off feelings of deprivation by hard work and strict attention to the job of winning the war. Frank and Julia Glute have been married two years. Donnie was born in February 1944. Frank is in the Air Corps, a bomber pilot trained in Texas. August 4. I guess today will be our final goodbye. I walked to Frank's barracks with him and tried awfully hard not to cry. I behaved quite well until I got back to the hotel, and then I just sobbed. Said goodbye to Julia and Donnie for the third time. This was it. Sure we'll miss her and the little guy. Frank goes to England. Julia goes home to Chicago, connected to her husband now through letters and their son. By the time the Allied armies reach the French border, the Italian campaign has been going on for more than a year. A year of slow advances bloody battles and destruction. From air bases all over southern Italy and nearby islands, pilots fly daily missions to destroy enemy troops and supply lines. 
Ralph Lewis in Italy to his parents. These men know they must continue to fly and fight and even die. Not for any reason an armchair patriot back home might give, but because the quicker they knock out the enemy, the sooner we can all go home. Newspaper accounts don't tell about the shattered nerves of those who survived and those who didn't make it back at all. They don't show the dejected faces of the ground crew members whose planes don't return, or the way they keep scanning the sky, hoping that somehow, some way, their ship will struggle home. After D-Day, when most of the world's attention turns to Northern Europe, the Italian campaign is at a stalemate. Many fighting in Italy feel forgotten and ignored, but some are aware of the danger they still face and the sacrifices they are making. Archbishop Francis Spellman, the Vicar General of the Armed Forces, conducts a mass for the men in Italy. Spellman writes home. These young American airmen believe that they are suffering and dying to bring salvation and peace to their fellow men. For some of them, it was the dawning of their last morning in this world. The value of each soldier's life pressed upon me. Bidding them Godspeed, I humbly accepted their messages. Tell my wife you were with me, said one. Martha Gellhorn. Soon the end of this long Italian campaign will become a fact, not a dream. No one wants to think of what men must still die and what men must still be wounded in the fighting before peace comes. It is awful to die when you know that the war is won anyhow. These days every man dead is a greater sorrow because the end of all this tragic dying is so near. General Eisenhower worries that the Americans will assume that the end of the war is near and become complacent. He writes to his wife, Mamie, every victory is sweet, but the end of the war will come only with the complete destruction of the Hun forces. There is still a lot of suffering to go through. God, I hate the Germans. When the German army reaches the Siegfried Line, it turns and fights. It isn't about conquest anymore. It's about survival. Fighter pilot Quinton Anderson riding home from England. I can hear heavy bombers going over. That means some part of Germany is going to catch hell tonight. But it also means some of those boys up above are going to die soon. You've got to see it and live it to realize just what is happening in the flat-filled skies over Germany. On October 21st, American troops capture Aachen, the first German city to fall. The victory is mostly symbolic. Aachen has little military value, but the losses are real. 5,000 American and 5,000 German casualties. Combat engineer Larry Kane writes to his wife, Grace. Hello, darling. The battle is over now, and it was a bloody, miserable fight. I picked up a lot of souvenirs, which I've sent to you. An SS officer's dress sword, two Nazi flags, and the Luftwaffe lieutenant's decorations. Tell our son that Daddy sends him a big hug. Ernie Pyle's last column from Europe. It will seem odd when the shooting stops and everything suddenly changes again. It will be odd to drive down an unknown road without that little knot of fear in your stomach. For some of us, the war has already gone on too long. Our feelings have been wrung and drained. They cringe from the effort of coming alive again. War has become a flat black depression without highlights, a revulsion of the mind and an exhaustion of the spirit. December, 1944. A terrible winter for the Parisians becomes the least of their worries on December 17th, Jackie Greer. 
This afternoon, we received the awful news that the Germans counterattacked and that they would be in Paris by Christmas. That last part I don't believe. The first part makes me feel sick. CBS Radio, four days later. The German offensive has not yet been halted. Two powerful drives are rolling ahead tonight, one through Belgium to within 18 miles of the fortress of Liège. The other has swept three quarters of the distance across Luxembourg. Red Cross worker Gisela Simon writes home from Belgium during the Battle of the Bulge. For the past three days, we've been visited nightly by Jerry, strafed and bombed, always with some casualties, but your little gizzy's still here dodging them. Damn, it's a nice clear night out. That ain't good. American losses are so high in the Battle of the Bulge that replacements are needed quickly and African-Americans are finally accepted as frontline fighting troops. Many of the wounded, black and white, are treated by the 50th General Hospital, now moved forward to an old French cavalry post. Paratrooper Ozzy Schock. I might start by telling you I was wounded. Today is the first time I've shaved in 23 days, and the first time I've had my trousers off. I've had them down, but never off. We've had much trouble with our machine guns. The bolt would freeze. We remedied that by urinating on them just before we fired them. This winter war is hell, and then some. The German counteroffensive is stopped after six weeks. 100,000 Germans are dead, wounded, or captured. 19,000 Americans have died the greatest American loss of the war. Martha Gellhorn in Belgium. There were many dead and many wounded, but the bulge was ironed out. This was not done fast or easily, and it was not done by those anonymous things, armies, divisions, regiments. It was done by men, one by one, your men. Thousands of German POWs are old men. Thousands more are children. Hitler youth grown fit and fanatical waiting for their moment. 19-year-old GI Bill Schleichter. Yesterday we had 10 kids in uniform. Couldn't have been over 12 to 14 years old. Doesn't seem that kids can do much harm, but put them behind a rifle or a machine gun, and they're sure to knock off one or two before they get hit. Berlin has again been the first to report the beginning of a new Russian offensive operation. This one, say the Germans, has been uncorked along the 40-mile front southwest of Budapest. Home movies taken by a German soldier show the Wehrmacht desperately trying to stop the relentless Soviet attack from the east, led by troops that are well acquainted with German brutality. A brutality their American and British allies discover as they advance from the west. Mass graves are revealed of partisans in France and American POWs in Belgium. At Nordhausen, GIs discover the victims of slave labor camps. At Luftstarlock III, liberated American POWs burn their prison. Private Murray Osborne writing to the GI newspaper Yank. The order the United States soldiers are to salute Nazi officer prisoners has left me bewildered. Can I forget that he's my mortal enemy? Can I forget that his uniform symbolizes all that is filthy and treacherous? GIs are told they're the best equipped army in the world. But in mud and snow, American combat boots get wet and stay wet, which can cause severe disability. From medicine in action, Trenchfoot. Trenchfoot ranks high in military importance when there was considerable combat activity on the 5th Army front in the winter of 1944, the ratio of trench foot to battle casualties 
was one to three and a half. Because trench foot can be avoided by regularly massaging the feet, some commanding officers make catching it a court-martial offense, like a self-inflicted wound. They ignore the hazards of massaging your feet in a frontline foxhole. By January 1945, Eisenhower needs 82,000 new troops. He gets boys just out of school who are often the first killed or captured. Training is an even bigger problem than equipment. Those of you who expect to take part in close engagements with the Germans will naturally watch this film with interest and try to remember what you see. An American training film featuring make-believe Nazis tells soldiers in boot camp how to recognize the enemy by his clothing. Along with the color of the uniform, these black boots should be well remembered as being one of your surest means of identification. From the soldier's handbook issued to every new GI. The soldier who is careless in his appearance is probably careless in everything else. Dandruff, dust, or cigarette ashes give a bad impression. Keep a whisk broom for brushing your uniform. The approach of tanks may be suspected by the noise of their motors or by unusual columns of dust. If you get a chance to shoot at a tank, aim at the vision slots. One of your principal jobs in the field is marching. A small pebble carried in the mouth keeps it moist and reduces thirst. With so many replacements, veterans suddenly find themselves fighting alongside strangers. Too many buddies gone home, gone to recover, gone forever. But the buddy is still one of the best things about soldiering. Sir, your son was a very personal friend of mine. Although he was a Mississippi State man, and I am Ole Miss, we became close friends and stayed together all the way through. His men thought him a great leader and were crazy about him. From the type of man he was, he had to come from a wonderful family. Respectfully, Billy Roberts. Thousands of wounded soldiers survive because of penicillin, generally available by 1944. But penicillin isn't the only reason. Al Schock writes about the day he was hit. Our company medic was so kind and brave about it all that I don't think I'll ever forget him. He risked his life to get me out. We were in no man's land. He dressed my wounds, gave me water, and talked to me like a mother. Soon after Private Clarence Weaver steps on a landmine, he's being treated in a battalion aid station. Two hours after that, he has surgery in an evac hospital. After transport on a hospital ship, Weaver gets rehabilitation in Iran, then more surgery and rehab stateside. With different stops, it's a journey taken by thousands of wounded GIs. B-17 pilot Kenneth Book. I have seen one hell of a bunch of sadly maimed fellows, fellows with legs gone, lost arms, deaf, blind, mental crack-ups. These are the boys who have paid the top price in this damned war. These are the boys that deserve the most, and if everything runs true to form, will get the least. These are the guys who have seen the worst of the war and I hope to God we'll remember enough to keep us out of another one for the next few generations. Clarence Weaver finally goes home, blind, with an artificial leg, but alive. More than 8,000 military chaplains served during the war. 
Men like Rabbi David Max Eichhorn, who often drives around the front in his Jeep with a Star of David and a box of matzos. The Jewish men come to thank God that the enemy does not stand on our soil and that we stand on his, to pray that next year each will sit with his own family and will eat real gefilte fish in Kednedlech, and will hear a childish voice in tone, Ma Nishtana Halayla Hazeh, and will celebrate the deliverance of Israel from Pharaoh, Haman, Antiochus, and Hitler. Frank Glute left his wife Julia and son Donnie to join more than two million Army Air Corpsmen in Britain. Showed the fellas Julia's and Donnie's pictures. They agree that Julia's beautiful and Donnie's very cute. He takes after his mother, I guess. I'm so tickled. Donnie said mama for the first time. He said it twice. It won't be long before he'll be talking. I have the blues. I felt so lonesome for Frank. By December 21st, 1944, Frank has flown 30 missions. Just five more and he gets to go home from his journal that day. Got nine letters from Julia. Finally got promoted to first lieutenant. Not alerted for tomorrow. March 3rd. The Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that your husband, First Lieutenant Glute Frank C., was killed in action. Stop. Report of his death was received from German government through International Red Cross. Stop. Confirming letter follows. Stop. In the wreckage of Frank Glute's plane, searchers find a pair of baby shoes. Sometimes all it takes to lift the morale of fighting men is a girl and a couple of donuts. Often close to the front, the Red Cross sends out donut trucks with female volunteers. Maida Leonard Riggs writes home to Massachusetts. If I tell you I helped cook 22,400 donuts last week, you can figure out how many of those guys we see at two donuts per man. Dirty men, tired men, scared men, and lately, battle-fatigued men who don't talk but just take their donuts and walk away. Donut Girl Florence Holtman. Three of us run a fine donut business here. The only realization a war goes on is when the planes have had a rough time, and then in a day or two you miss a bright-eyed boy and nothing is ever said about it. The USO and its British equivalent, ENSA, entertained the troops. Thousands of artistes perform on everything from huge stages to flatbed trucks. In the Nuremberg Stadium, where a decade before Hitler held massive Nazi rallies, soldiers watched the Yankee Doodlers. A sergeant riding home. Ma, I seen my first classical show yesterday. And boy, that sure was a good change from Mersey Dotes and Shoo Shoo Baby. Edward R. Murrow reporting from Europe. It is impossible to keep up with this war. Overhead, the C-47s carrying supplies go in right down on the deck. The tanks on the concrete road sound like a huge sausage machine grinding up sheets of corrugated iron. And when there is a gap between convoys, when the noise dies away, there is another small sound, that of wooden-soled shoes and of small iron tires grating on the concrete. The power moves forward while the people walk back, pulling their small belongings on anything that has wheels. Six million refugees wander through Europe. Larry Kane in Germany. Poles, Russians, Ukrainians, Czechs, Frenchmen, Belgians, Dutchmen, Norwegians, women, children, men, old and young, all trekking towards the displaced person centers. They seem happy in a stunned sort of way. 
Talk about oppression and misery. Christ, we Americans are lucky that we hardly know the meaning of the words. The Americans and British inflict horrific bombing raids on German cities. Dwight Eisenhower says, I am always prepared to take part in anything that gives real promise of ending the war quickly. Some civilians and soldiers criticize the Allied area bombing of cities. Lieutenant General Ira Eker, Deputy Air Force Chief, claims such attacks will show the Germans. That we are the barbarians they say we are, for it would be perfectly obvious to them that this is primarily a large-scale attack on civilians, as of course it will be. Eker's superior, General Hap Arnold, commander of the Army Air Forces. We must not get soft. War must be destructive and to a certain extent, inhuman and ruthless. The United States and Britain dropped five billion pounds of bombs on Europe, killing an estimated 650,000 Germans, predominantly women, children, and old men. In Dresden, Frankfurt, Hamburg, Dusseldorf, Cologne. Because of years of Nazi brutality on the Eastern Front, Russians have died in the millions. Wehrmacht soldiers believe the Red Army shoot all their German prisoners in revenge, so they eagerly surrender to the Western Allies. Eisenhower expects three million German POWs. He gets five million. Al de Grazia. The Nazi flag at the moment is any sort of white cloth. Sheets and pillowcases wave in the conquerors of the Third Reich. Hitler is unpopular among civilians now that they're crushed. It took all of this to make them change their minds. A third of all the GIs in Europe have some German ancestry. But family history doesn't diminish their increasing dislike of German soldiers. Al de Grazia writing to his wife, Jill. I am repelled by the necessity of treating men as scum, even if they are scum. Jill de Grazia to Al. I hope you're giving him hell, for unlike you, I still hate them. On April 11th, 1945, the American Third Army arrives at a place called Buchenwald. First Lieutenant James Carroll Jordan in a letter to his wife. The camp has been liberated only two days. We saw a German monument that stated 51,600 died in this camp in three years. They were proud of it. On orders of American command, residents of the nearby town of Weimar are brought to Buchenwald and led through the camp. Margaret Burke White reporting in Life. Women fainted. Men covered their faces and turned their heads away. When the civilians cried out, we didn't know. The liberated prisoners were beside themselves with fury. You knew, they screamed. Edward R. Murrow. Murder had been done at Bougainville. God alone knows how many men and boys have died there during the last 12 years. Thursday, I was told that there were more than 20,000 in the camp. There had been as many as 60,000. Where are they now? I have reported what I saw and heard, but only part of it. For most of it, I have no words. Morrow visits Buchenwald April 12th, 
the same day President Franklin Roosevelt dies. Memorial services are held in allied cities from the Paris newspaper La Monde. The great voice which directed American political destinies has been hushed, but its echo continues in French souls. Let us weep for this man. Red Cross worker Rosie Norwalk writes from London. The really surprising thing is how deeply the British have reacted. They are so damn self-assured and unemotional that their open displays of feelings amazes me. Two weeks later, American troops opened the gates of Dachau. Like Buchenwald, a concentration camp for political and military prisoners. Not a killing center like Auschwitz and Treblinka, but a deadly place for thousands nonetheless. Among the Americans at Dachau is Rabbi David Max Eichhorn, who conducts the camp's first Sabbath service, chanting a prayer for the dead. El mole rachamim, shochen bamromim, hamse menucha nechona tachas kanfei hashchina. A day of celebration shall this be for you, a day when every man shall return to his family and to his rightful place in society. Today I come to you in a dual capacity, as a soldier in the American army and as a representative of the Jewish community of America. As an American soldier, I say to you that we are proud, very proud, to be here, to know that we have had a share in the destruction of the most cruel tyranny of all time. The service ends with a choir of just liberated Hungarian Jewish women singing a song Rabbi Eichhorn has just taught them. Martha Gellhorn. We are not entirely guiltless, we the Allies, because it took us 12 years to open the gates of Dachau. We were blind and unbelieving and slow, and that can never be again. And if ever again we tolerate such cruelty, we have no right to peace. In late April, on the Elbe River near the German town of Torgau, the two most powerful allies in the world, the Russians and the Yanks, finally meet. And two days later, meet again for the world's press. They are only 70 miles from Berlin, and the mood is festive. Ed Cunningham reporting for Yank. A Russian major set the tone with a toast. Today, he said, we have the most happy day of our lives. Just now, our great friends and we have met one another, and it is the end of our enemy. Long live our great countries. The Allies agree that post-war Germany will be divided into four occupation zones, with Berlin in the Soviet sector. So the Russians move on to Berlin while the British stop at the Baltic and the Americans stop at the Elbe. General Patton and British Field Marshal Montgomery, who have been racing for Berlin, are furious. But not the GIs. PFC Ned Davis. I say let Russia occupy Germany. It may sound quite barbarous to most of us, but I think total demolition of the Nazis should be carried through. The Russians would do this. Hitler commits suicide on April 30th, 1945. 200,000 Russians die taking Berlin. Virginia Irwin is the first Western correspondent into the city. The Russians were happy with an almost indescribably wild joy. They were in Berlin. In this German capital lies their true revenge for Leningrad and Stalingrad, for Sevastopol and Moscow. 
and the Russians are having their revenge. Although Stalin's own people are starving, for political reasons, he feeds the Berliners. At the same time, thousands of Berlin women are raped by Soviet troops. Swiss journalist Max Schnitzer. One woman died from being misused by the soldiers. In other houses, the Russians acted more like friends. They are like a hailstorm that only destroys part of the harvest. The people of Europe have endured unprecedented destruction. Now, at last, it is over. President Truman, May 8, 1945. The Allied armies, through sacrifice and devotion, have wrung from Germany a final and unconditional surrender. The Western world has been freed of the evil forces which for five years and longer have imprisoned the bodies and broken the lives of millions upon millions of freeborn men. Edith Sokol, Cleveland, Ohio. VE Day, officially today. Same old day, same old routine. Same old nightly letter when I should be kissing you in order to celebrate. I adore you, my darling. You are my world. There is no one like you. Edna Gladstone, New York City. Whether these celebrated days mean that I'll see you in a few weeks, months, or years, you will find when you do come home that this is the woman who will love you all her life. First Lieutenant Bill Preston with the Third Army in Germany. We heard that there were wild celebrations in the streets of London, but the frontline troops didn't celebrate. Most of the men merely read the story of victory from the division bulletin, said something like, I'm glad, and walked away. They were too tired of thinking of home too much, or thinking of their buddies who didn't live to see the victory. Florence Webb, Gas City, Indiana. My only fear now is that you'll be sent to the Pacific I'm counting so much on your getting home. 30 million people, two-thirds of them civilians, die in the European war. Those who survive are changed forever. They go home as different people, to different people. We will never be the naive innocents we were, none of us. Army nurse Marjorie LaPalm. Perhaps most of all, I will remember the quiet courage of common, ordinary people. Flyer Quentin Annenson. I fought and killed not only because it's my job, but also because my hope for happiness lies beyond this horror. I've gambled my life so that my sons won't have to go through the same thing. An unknown combat veteran of Europe. I am being sent home. Going back to the United States is not the shining goal it might seem, as long as it's still being blurred by the blood of Americans dying for freedom on foreign soil. <laughs>